Hi everyone, happy Tuesday. Um, it's True Crime Tuesday, so we're just gonna go ahead and get into it. Um, today's case for the month of, oh, excuse me. So for the month of February, I have decided to cover some um, black cases. Um, today's case involves a black victim not a black perpetrator um so we're just gonna go ahead and get right into it uh i would give a usual um content warning but because of the importance of this case i feel like everyone should watch it regardless of the content that is in it um i know that i usually give content warnings for all other people but because of the nature and the severity and the importance of this case i highly recommend that everyone watch it regardless because it is very important so with all that being said we are just going to jump right into it and today we are going to be discussing the murder of james bird <laughs> James Bird Jr. was born May 2nd, 1949 in Beaumont, Texas. Um, shortly after he was born, the family did move to Jasper, Texas. And he was the third of nine children born to Stella and James Bird Sr. Um, not much is known about his childhood. I should have probably mentioned in the beginning that this case has very little um, information about backgrounds and everything so uh, we do not have that um, his mother was a Sunday school teacher and his father was a deacon um, I don't know what they did outside of that in 1967 James graduated from Jasper Row High School and he graduated in the last segregated class of the school before they went ahead and integrated everything and shortly after graduating, he got married and he had three children, Renee, Ross, and Jamie. Um, unfortunately, he would get divorced in 1993. He lived as a vac. well, his for a living, he was a vacuum salesman and he was known by a lot of the people in town. And he would often be seen a lot uh, walking about because he didn't own a car. So that's another way that everybody kind of knew him because he was just always out and about in addition to him going door to door and selling vacuums and everything. So everyone knew who he was. Um, during his lifetime, James would go to prison for theft, forgery, and violation of parole. On June 7th, 1998, James was attending his niece's bridal shower and he just spent the day kind of socializing with family, uh, drinking, just celebrating her upcoming nuptials. And when the party was coming to an end, he started his journey walking home. As he was walking home, he was approached by a gray Ford pickup truck and they offered him a ride and he accepted and he was seen getting into the bed of the truck between 2 30 a.m and 2 45 a.m on june 8th and that would be the last time james was ever seen alive john bill king was born november 3rd of 1974 making him a Scorpio. Sean Barry was born on February 12th, 1974, making him an Aquarius. Lawrence Brewer was born on March 13th of 1967, making him a Pisces. Um, they were all previously convicted criminals. Um, Sean's criminal history wasn't as long as the history, the criminal history of the other two men. Um, Sean just went to prison for petty crimes like theft. Um, where on the other hand, Lawrence went to jail for drug possession. 
and stuff. Um, I'm not exactly sure what uh, John King, well, I'm going to be calling him Bill. Um, I'm not sure what Bill went to prison for, but the connection between the three of them is that Sean and Sean and Bill were both 23 years old. They went to high school together and they remained friends after they graduated. Um, when Bill was in prison, he would meet Lawrence. Um, when Bill was in prison, he was actually gang raped by some black inmates. And when he met Bill, he and Bill kind of bonded with each other and they ended up joining the white supremacy Aryan Brotherhood while they were in prison for protection from the black inmates. Bill was released from prison before Lawrence was and Lawrence wasn't originally from Jasper. However, um, because of the close relationship they had when they were in prison together, when he got out, he ended up moving to Jasper and he began Lawrence ended up moving to Jasper and he began living with Bill. It is it's suspected that the two were members of the KKK, but that has not been proven. So it is June 7th of 1998 and it is the night and Bill, Sean, and Lawrence are all riding around drinking beer and looking for young women to pick up and Sean it's Sean's truck so Sean is the one that's driving please remember that because it is very important so Sean is driving and they're just all cruising and everything and they see a, a black man walking on the side of the road and Sean recognizes this man as James Bird. So he decides to pull over and offer him a ride home. To which James accepts. So he says, yes, I'll accept the ride home. And he gets into the bed of the truck, leaving the three men in the cab. Now we're not exactly sure what was discussed in the cab. But from what it ends up seeming like because Lawrence and Bill are white supremacists um it could be said that when Sean pulled him over to offer him a ride that is when they began their plan for what they were going to do to him um and I have a few problems with that because if you are friends first of all why are you friends with white supremacists that's number one. Number two, if you are friends with white supremacists, why would you offer a black man a ride home in the same vehicle as two white supremacists? It don't make sense to me. But neither here nor there, James gets into the bed of the truck and the truck takes off. Now, James was spotted by witnesses in the bed of the truck between 2.30 and 2.45 a.m., and from what they could assume, he was just being taken home. But of course, the clan, no pun intended, had other plans. So because James is in because James is in the bed of the truck, obviously he cannot see where they are going. And he does not know that they are not taking him home. He doesn't realize that they are actually driving east which is out of jasper completely so they are driving down a county road and it's empty because it's like almost 3 a.m at this point if not 3 a.m and they end up pulling over and when they pull over the three men get out of the car and of course, James is confused because he's under the impression that he's going home and they pull him out of the bed of the truck. Well, James wasn't going down without a fight. 
and forensic evidence shows that there were signs of a struggle due to the dirt being shifted the grass being shifted and there was a broken beer bottle found at the scene of the crime so that's just further proof that james was fighting for his life now the rest of the details of the case are a bit shaky because all that we have is sean's testimony so according to sean when the group was struggling to subdue james i guess you could say bill went and grabbed a baseball bat and proceeded to hit him over and over again with him just so they could take him down so once he was taken down the group and i do emphasize group they repeatedly beat him and once he is to the point where he's not really fighting back anymore bill grabs james by his legs and drags him to the bed of the truck where he is chained to the trailer hitch and then bill jumps into the driver's seat of sean's truck now, all three men are in the truck and James is attached to the trailer hitch on the truck. The men decide that they are going to drag James in the truck. I have no idea if their intention was to kill him or if it was just to harm him a lot. But they, they proceed to start dragging him down County Road 287. So Bill is in the driver's seat of Sean's truck and he begins to drive and when he's driving they are going down uh, County Road 278 and James is still trying his best to survive um, because he is being pulled by his ankles. Um, forensic evidence showed that he tried to like hold his head up so that his head wasn't it was an asphalt road it's an asphalt road um so he was trying to keep his head up to keep his head from uh dragging along the asphalt and like killing him but unfortunately they drag him for about a mile and a half and they hit a turn and when they hit this turn james's body kind of like trails into a ditch and at the edge of the ditch is a culvert um i'm not quite sure how to explain what a culvert is but it's like where um it's like a concrete thing that has a door on it and when you open the door it has like the water pipes if that makes sense if i'm able to describe it that well that's basically what I have to say it is. So for a mile and a half, which is a long time, might I add, that is a very long time. So for a mile and a half, they're dragging James and then they get around this turn where his body ends up hitting the culvert and it's concrete. So when his body hits the culvert, it severs his arm, his right arm is completely severed and it also severs his shoulder and his head. So he has his arm missing and he is completely decapitated from hitting this concrete culvert. As if that is not bad enough, the men keep driving another mile and a half. So in total, they drove three miles. Their plan was to drag James about three miles. And when they finally pulled the truck over, um, his remains were only his torso, his left arm, and his legs. And they decided to go ahead and detach his body from the trailer. And they dumped his remains at a black church. 
I'm not sure how they knew that it was a black church, but they ended up dropping the remains off at a in the front of a black church. So I'm assuming that this took place on a Saturday night. I'll probably have to like go to my calendar and see exactly what date of the week this was. But um, I'm assuming it was a Saturday and they planted his body there so that when someone went to church Sunday, they would find his body. Well, that did not happen because, well, let me, let me backtrack. They drop his body off and then they go to a barbecue. It's 3 a.m. Who the hell is hosting a barbecue unless they are KKK affiliated because the KKK does stuff at night. Don't ask me how I know, but they do stuff at night. Um, so if they're going to a KKK barbecue, doesn't that mean that Sean? I'm going to shut up though. So they dump the body and go to a barbecue. Well, the next morning, as someone is driving down County Road 278, they find a severed arm and a head on the side of the road. So, quite naturally, they call the police. So, when the police arrive at the scene and they're going down the road collecting evidence, they can see in 81 different places where a piece of James's body was. And when they did find the rest of his body, almost all of his ribs were broken. So when they found his head, um, everything was kind of still intact. It was a, I hate to describe it this way, but it was like a clean cut. Um, his head was still intact. His skull was still intact. His brain was still intact. And during his autopsy, it was determined that James survived the mile and a half dragging and what killed him was actually being decapitated which is horrible to think about he survived half of his attack um that is just very tragic to think about so police also find a wrench and the wrench has the name Barry written on it and also they find a lighter and the lighter has possum engraved in it um and possum was bill's prison nickname so now police are like okay once we find barry and whoever the hell possum are we will find our killers so it's a few days later, if I'm not mistaken. I really didn't have a timeline on how long it took them to catch them. But I'll just say following the attack. Follow, well, following the murder, because it's now murder. Following the murder, there is a traffic stop. And a gray Ford pickup truck is pulled over. And it's a routine traffic stop. They just ran a red light, ran a stop sign, you know, something like that. And the owner of the vehicle that is pulled over is, of course, Sean Barry. So he just pulls him over, you know, routine traffic stop. You know, do you realize that you ran a red light? Do you realize that you ran a stop sign? Whatever, whatever. But as he is asking him these questions, he notices some very incriminating evidence, I must say. And he begins to suspect foul play. So he then arrests the driver of the vehicle, which I'm assuming is Sean Barry, but I'm not exactly sure. I'm not even sure if Sean was in the car alone, but whoever got the prison, which I'm assuming is Sean, they read it on everybody. They could not hold water. They could not hold anything. So they told, they started singing. So. For the sake of making this make sense, we're just going to assume that it is Sean. So Sean gets arrested and he's being asked about the blood that was found on the undercarriage of his vehicle. 
and that is when he decides to come clean and tell police everything that happens because to be honest it's only a matter of time before they find out what happens anyway so all three men sean lawrence and bill are arrested and when they are arrested they are given separate trials so sean's trial is first and he puts everything he accepts no he does not hold himself accountable he does not accept responsibility for what happened he is just look i had nothing to do with this they did everything which is not fair it's not fair at all but the other participants in the crime didn't really refute this statement um it is very possible that sean could have been bullied into this whole thing because of who well sean is 23 bill is 23 lawrence is old ass is 31 years old running around with these two 23 year olds so it's very possible that he was influenced into this and that he didn't think that it would go as far as it did but that is still absolutely no excuse you are still harming an innocent person well his entire trial was a fucking circus because his attorneys to prove that sean was not racist and that it wasn't a hate crime because they were being they were charged with capital murder but this was like around the time where like hate crime legislation was like booming so they were also being charged with the hate crime after they found um Aryan Brotherhood white supremacy literature at the apartment of Bill and Lawrence. And not to mention, Bill and Lawrence, when they joined the white supremacy group when they were in prison, they came home with a plethora of racist tattoos. Um, I'm not sure exactly what Lawrence's tattoos were, but I do remember that um, Bill had a tattoo of a black man hanging from a tree. He also had a tattoo that said Aryan pride. So they were very well known for being white supremacists. So Sean's lawyers get three black men to come in and basically they pulled the I'm not racist, I have black friends card and it worked to a degree because the prosecutors decided that although Sean may not be a white supremacist, he is equally responsible for the crimes that were committed as every other party, which they are absolutely right. So Sean was given, in comparison to the other two, he was given a lighter sentence to say that he was charged with capital murder and he was found guilty and he received life in prison. Um, he is eligible for parole in June of 2038. He will be 63 years old. I think it's gonna be denied. And if it's not gonna be denied, I hope it's gonna be denied because he is equally as responsible as everybody else. And it's his fault. Like you're driving. If you don't wanna stop and pick somebody up, that man was just walking home like he always do. He could have made it home. He didn't need y'all to stop and pick him up. He would have been fine. But it's Sean's fault. So next is Bill's trial. Um, not really much to say about his trial. He didn't really try to like fight anything or nothing like that. Um, he pretty much just accepted that he did what he did and he was gonna get the needle. So he didn't. I mean, he pled not guilty, but he understood that there was nothing that he could really do about it. It was no point in pointing the finger back and forth with everything. So it just was what it was. Now, during Sean's testimony, he did say that Bill was the one that started beating James with the bat and everything. So he didn't refute it. Um, nothing of that nature. He kind of just... Not like, yeah, I did it, but he didn't 
contest. Is that the word I'm looking for? He didn't contest. So they just went ahead and that was it for him. And unfortunately for Bill, because of uh, Sean's testimony, he was sentenced to death. Yeah, he was convicted and he was sentenced to death. Big death. And he was executed on April 14th of 1919. April 14th of 2019. That is when he was executed. Now baby Lawrence. Lawrence was a problem because he was determined to be the biggest asshole possible in this entire case. Um, he was just, oh my God, I don't even know how to describe this. Just He was literally white Satan. Like, he was just a horrible person. And I don't have much information about his trial. But oh baby, I got a lot of information about after the trial. So, uh, Lawrence was also convicted and found guilty. Of course, that's what convicted means, duh. Um, but he was also sentenced to death, is what I meant to say. But he decided that he was going to be as much of an asshole as possible before he was sentenced to death. Okay, so leading up to Lawrence's execution, um, he, this lash is not sticking and I really don't care, but um, he showed absolutely no remorse. He was not sorry for what he did and um, KQ11, um, the news station in Houston, they actually got a statement from him the day before his execution and he said, and I quote, as far as any regrets, no, I have no regrets. I do it all again. I do it all over again to tell you the truth, end quote. So that's pretty much um, how he felt about that. And Lawrence also decided to make history when um, he ordered his last meal. And his last meal consisted of two fried chicken steaks with gravy and onions, a triple patty bacon cheeseburger, a cheese omelet with ground beef, tomatoes, onions, bell peppers, and jalapenos, a bowl of fried okra with ketchup, one pound of barbecued meat with half a bag of, with half a loaf of bread, three fully loaded fajitas, a meat lover's pizza, one pint of bluebell vanilla ice cream, a slab of peanut butter fudge with crushed peanuts on top, and three root beers. That was his last meal. But when the meal was presented to him, he ended up telling the prison work workers, people, whatever, that um, he wasn't hungry. And so he did not touch anything that he asked for. And the meal had to be discarded because he literally didn't touch anything. State Senator John Wilmire um, called up some higher ups and he asked that the last meal no longer be offered to convicted criminals that are on death row and the higher ups were like <laughs> effective immediately we ain't doing it no more so because of lawrence brewer the 87 year tradition came to an end um i think i mentioned this in another video i'm not sure which one somebody had a last meal and i mentioned this case in the last meal of the other case Eileen Warnos in the Eileen Warnos video because her last meal was a cup of coffee and I mentioned this case in that video but regardless so um he was executed on September 21st of 2011 that's it kaput um during the 2000 uh presidential campaign of George W. Bush he was um called a racist which no surprise there but when he was governor he was completely opposed to hate crime legislation and because of this he received a lot of backlash and he also um because of a prior commitment he was unfortunately unable to attend james burr's funeral and he received a lot of backlash for that as well um unfortunately he became the president of the united states so i don't think they gave two shits the 77th Texas Legislature, I'm struggling to talk right now, 
they passed the James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Act. And um, Texas Governor Rick Perry ended up signing it into law in 2001. So that is that. And they also changed the Matthew Shepard Act to the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crime Prevention Act. Who that's a lot of words, but it is still widely known as the Matthew Shepard Act. And um, it was originally the Hate Crimes Act of 1968. And since that has happened, it has been expanded to include um, gender, sexual orientation, disabilities, race, Basically, anything that's out of your control is protected in the new Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crime Prevention Act. So, yes. Um, this case was also turned into a movie. The title of the movie is titled Jasper. I have yet to see the movie. I'm actually terrified to watch it because I don't know what's going to happen. I may watch it. It's Black History Month, so I may watch it. But um, if you guys have seen it, you know, let me know down below in the comments if you recommend it. I am probably going to, if I don't, if I don't watch it today, I'll watch it this week. But I'm going to make it a point to watch it. And um, I'll let you guys know how it was. But thank you so much for joining me for this video. Um, I am going to be wearing black eyeshadow for the rest of my true crime cases this month. So get prepared to see this look about three more times. I think how many more Tuesdays we got about about two to three more times you're gonna see this not exactly I might change the color at the top but it's going to be black eyeshadow so yeah um that is all I have for today's case uh if you have any suggestions for a case that you would like to see because I have not prepared my case for next week yet even though I do have something in mind um do feel free to let me know so that I have time to prepare for next week and I will see you in next week's video. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Yeah, there we go. See you guys next Tuesday.